you for joining us. Today, the Tactical Air and Land Forces Subcommittee meets to receive an update on Army acquisition and modernization programs. I would like to thank our witnesses for being here today. They are Lieutenant General Robert Lennox, Deputy Chief of Staff of the Army, G-8, and Lieutenant General William Phillips, Military Deputy to the Assistant of the Army for Acquisition Logistics and Technology, and Ms. Belva Martin, Government Accountability Office, Director of Acquisition and Sourcing Team. Since the subcommittee last received testimony from Army leaders, there have been many programmatic changes to major Army programs. In addition, as I have stated before, major reductions in the federal budget need to be a major element of correcting the federal budget. The Department of Defense must share in a fair and balanced way in these reductions. That process is already taking place under the Budget Control Act of uh, 2011, with nearly $500 billion in cuts planned for DOD over the next 10 years. Further cuts beyond the four to five hundred billion are possible, up to approximately one trillion total over ten years, under what Secretary Panetta has called the doomsday mechanism sequestration provision of the Budget Control Act. It remains unclear how DOD would apportion funding reductions and how funding reductions will impact Army modernization programs. The purpose of today's hearing is to get an update from the witnesses as to what changes may have to be made in their proposed acquisition programs in fiscal year 2012. We would like to hear from our witnesses what their major issues and concerns are. What should our members be most aware of as the fiscal year 2012 request is finalized in Congress? Finally, we would like to know the views of our witnesses on what potential impacts to Army capabilities could occur, particularly in light of the possible reductions in the Army's procurement and R&D budgets. A couple of examples of our concerns are what we understand to be the Army's top two modernization priorities, the ground combat vehicle and the network. The GCV program received milestone A approval, entry into the technology development phase in August of 2011. Although the program is currently under a general accounting office protest, we do expect to learn more about the GCV acquisition strategy and requirements stemming from the most recent Office of the Secretary of Defense Acquisition Decision Memorandum. And for the network, we would like to learn more about how the recent network integration exercises at Fort Bliss and White Sands Missile Range are helping the Army make informed budget decisions. Most recently, Congress has informed that the ground mobile radio, part of the joint tactical radio system and the network, was terminated as a result of the non mccurdy process. I thank all of you for your service to our country and for being here today. I look forward to your testimony. Now to my very good friend from Texas, the ranking member, Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me add my welcome to all our guests here uh, this afternoon. Today's hearing on Army modernization comes at a critical juncture for the future of the U.S. Army. On the one hand, with the end of war in Iraq, the Army may finally have a chance to improve dwell time for troops and their families, and also to repair worn-out equipment. At the same time, the war in Afghanistan continues, and the Army still has to be prepared to deploy troops to Korea and other potential flashpoints. And finally, laid on top of those demands, the Army is conducting a planned drawdown uh, in the size of the Army from 567,000 uh, active duty troops to uh, of around 520,000. Balancing those three factors will no doubt, as the chairman pointed out, be difficult. When one, when one turns uh, to the issue of modernizing the Army's equipment, I think it is important to remember what has been accomplished over the past 10 years. First, the Army has fielded hundreds of UAVs and other ISR platforms that give today's soldiers far more capability to find the enemy and to understand uh, their intentions. Second, the Army has upgraded almost its entire vehicle fleet, from Abrams tanks to trucks to strikers to M-ramps. And third, the Army now provides personal soldier uh, equipment vastly improved over what the troops were issued in 2001, including better body armor and personal weapons. Uh, four, the Army continues to invest in aviation capability, increasing both the quantity and the quality of helicopters in its force. The Army, uh, fifth, the Army is working hard to get more network communications equipment in the field, including the large-scale network integra integration exercises at Fort Bliss in my district. Uh, 
six. So while some programs didn't work out as planned, uh, a, lot, a lot of very smart investments were made, and today's Army is better equipped than, than ever before. However, the Army must continue to modernize in critical areas to stay ahead uh, and to plan for future threats. I felt that the modernization plan presented the Army at our hearing in April uh, was, a, was a solid one, integrated plan for moving the Army forward on its uh, top priorities, which were pushing the network uh, down to the soldiers, continuing to expand aviation capability, uh, and third, investing in, in programs for the future. However, since that hearing, Congress passed the Budget Control Act that will cut $450 billion from DOD budgets over the next 10 years. Additional cuts uh, may come from the Super Committee uh, and certainly are uh, uh, a concern uh, since they, they may be possible. How the Army plans to deal with those reductions in FY12 is a major issue, I believe, for today's hearing. While I'm confident uh, the Army will do its best uh, uh, to adapt, I am concerned that disproportional cuts to modernization may be doing real damage uh, to the future of our Army. Too often, discussions about, quote unquote, what the Army needs are focused exclusively on today's fight, even though Army leaders uh, have to also focus on being ready for whatever the next challenge or conflict may be. The ground combat vehicle is one example. With the Army planning only incremental upgrades to Abrams and Bradley fighting vehicles in the future, it is clear that the Army must start investing now uh, in the vehicle it will need in the 2020s. Despite the need, the GCV uh, has already been delayed uh, for months by contract delays and protests. If it does not move forward soon, then the Army won't have any new combat vehicles in development. The Joint Air-to-Ground Missile, or uh, JAGRAM, is another example. While Hellfire missiles are doing a great job today, uh, in the future, the Army will need a more capable missile uh, to defeat advanced countermeasures uh, from longer ranges. Uh, if it is terminated, as some press reports have suggested, then the future Army won't have the best missiles available, and the nation might lose critical missile research and development capability. Overall, uh, I am concerned that the Army's investments in critical future capabilities uh, could bear the brunt of reductions uh, in the Army's budget. Uh, uh, having said that, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to, to hearing from our panel about the future of those programs uh, and other uh, concerns that may be on their minds. And uh, with that, I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. We will proceed now with the panel's testimony and then go into questions. Without objection, all witnesses' prepared statements will be included in the hearing record. General Lennox, please proceed with your opening remarks, and you will be followed by General Phillips and Ms. Martin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Bartlett, Congressman Reyes, and, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Army acquisition and modernization. We'll be providing the committee with an update on our Army's affordable modernization strategy its processes and the changes in key programs since our last meeting in, in the spring. On behalf of Secretary McHugh and, and General Odierno, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the members of this committee for your steadfast support and shared commitment in this endeavor to provide the more than one million men and women in our Army with world-class weapon systems and equipment to ensure mission success in combat. The Army's equipment modernization goal is to develop and field a versatile and affordable mix of equipment to allow soldiers and units to succeed across the spectrum of conflict both today and, and tomorrow, and to maintain our decisive advantage over any enemy that we face. Our first priority is to win today's fight. We currently have over 70,000 soldiers in Afghanistan and about 50,000 soldiers still serving in Iraq, and we must not forget them as they continue to serve in harm's way, and I know this panel feels the same way. Our second priority is to prepare for the future. To do this, our equipment modernization strategy provides a balanced approach and features really three aspects. The first is we look at, at our portfolios in an integrated way, trying to balance requirements, resources, and their acquisition process. And we have very consistent reviews of those portfolios. Secondly, we're, we're focusing on incremental modernization. 
We're trying to deliver improved capabilities as technologies mature, resources are available, and necessity dictates. And third, we, we feel that in, in an R4 Gen matter, and that's really trying to match equipment with the mission that the soldiers are going to deploy on. So we'll match the equipment they need, modernize for the mission that they've got. We look forward to discussing our priority modernization programs, which include the network, ground combat vehicle, joint light tactical vehicle, the Paladin program, Kiowa Warrior, and, and others. We recognize that we must shape the Army of 2020 with an understanding of our national security obligations and the current fiscal crisis. We will constantly reform how we do business to remain good stewards of the resources that are provided to us. And we recognize that we may have a smaller army in the future, but that smaller army must be trained and equipped to defeat any adversary. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I, I thank you again for your steadfast and generous support of the outstanding men and women of the United States Army, of Army civilians and their families, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, General Phillips. Chairman Bartlett, Ranking Member Reyes, and the distinguished members of this committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear bef before you and to discuss uh, Army acquisition modernization and our acquisition strategies. I'm really proud and honored to be here with my battle buddy, uh, Lieutenant General Bob Lennox, and Ms. Martin from the GAO. Uh, throughout our affordable modernization strategy, we are dedicated to meeting the needs of our soldiers around the world and around the clock. We thank you for your wisdom and your strong support for our soldiers and their families. The Army acquisition community is committed to delivering enhanced capabilities to our soldiers in a timely and affordable manner. The Army has undertaken a number of efficiencies, initiatives, including streamlining the acquisition process to focus on collaboration among stakeholders early and upfront in the process, to properly align requirements and resources with our acquisition strategy, and we are closely examining technological maturity to achieve realistic program goals. We are encouraging competition and innovative contracting strategies in order to control cost. We are a full partner in the Department of Defense Better Buying Initiatives. In fact, we are now, and we have been for the past year, changing the paradigm within Army acquisition and within the thought process of Army acquisition leaders as it relates to cost, schedule, and performance. We are aggressively challenging requirements and seeking trade-offs that achieve greater affordability and executability of programs. We cannot afford any requirement at any cost. We are implementing smarter test and evaluation strategies to get real-time soldier feedback, leveraging the network integration exercise at White Sands Missile Range in Fort Bliss, and certainly we invite all of you, the members of this committee, to visit us out at Fort Bliss and White Sands Missile Range. We are codifying our rapid acquisition procedures and introducing testing and prototyping earlier in the development cycle as other ways to reduce cost and risk and to achieve more agile acquisition strategies. We must have realistic cost estimating from the very beginning of a program that provides insights into individual requirements. We take our fiduciary responsibilities to Congress and the American people uh, seriously, and we will take full advantage of every dollar that you provide us. Our, process, our progress and successes are detailed in the written statement, and I won't go into them. General Lennox just mentioned some of them, but uh, MRAP ATV and Stryker Double V Hull are those that are serving today in Afghanistan and saving lives. There's others like counter-improvised explosive devices. We do continue our efforts to improve soldier protection in body armor and vehicles to bring the power of the network to the individual soldier and to lighten the load of our soldiers as well. Our strategy to meet these needs include conducting capability portfolio reviews and as a result of the Weapon Systems Acquisition Reform Act, we've also implemented configuration steering boards of which last year the Army completed 100 percent of all the required CSBs mandated uh, by statute. Mr. Chairman, the Army is committed to improving our acquisition processes and delivering affordable programs that meet the needs of our soldiers today and tomorrow. We cannot fail. Our soldiers trust us that we will provide them the very best equipment so that they can succeed on the field of battle and that one day they can return home safely to their families and their friends. We cannot betray their trust. 
In executing our responsibilities, we will ensure that the Army, Army remains the nation's force for decisive action. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of this subcommittee, your deep and abiding commitment to our men and women in uniform is widely recognized throughout our ranks. We thank you for your continued support that ensures mission success and the safe return home of our soldiers. I look forward to your questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Ms. Martin. I am pleased, uh, Chairman Bartlett, Ranking Member Reyes, and members of the subcommittee. I am pleased to be here today to discuss the Army's recent modernization efforts. I will summarize my prepared statement. As background, the Army has faced some struggles in its modernization program since terminating the future combat system, known as FCS, in June of 2009. I would now like to highlight four key areas. First, when GAO testified before this subcommittee in March, we raised issues about GCV in the areas of urgency of the need, cost and affordability, analysis of alternatives to meet the need, and plausibility of delivering a production vehicle in seven years. While DOD and the Army have increased their oversight of the program, these questions are still relevant and it is expected that they will be fully explored during the current technology development phase. The Army has a challenge ahead to identify a feasible and cost-effective solution to meet its needs. Second, during the recently completed technology development phase, the Army and the Marine Corps learned that some of their original projected requirements for JLTV were not achievable. The services are now planning to have industry build prototypes for testing before a production decision to save time and money. However, there is a risk with this strategy. Even with demonstrated prototypes, skipping the detailed design and development testing process could result in the services discovering late that the vehicles are still not mature. In a related effort, the Army is modernizing portions of its up-armored Humvees to improve blast protection and extend its service life by 15 years, among other requirements. Third, the Army has moved away from its plans for a single network program and is now using an incremental approach where it builds on capabilities already in place and is getting soldier feedback and as you mentioned, uh, White Sands and uh, Fort Bliss. This is a positive development. However, to avoid potentially wasting resources by developing a number of stovepipe capabilities that may not work together, it is important for the Army to define requirements for the network. One network program that has been in development for over a decade was recently terminated, and you referred to the uh, ground um, mobile radio program, and it was expected to be a key component of the network. The Army still has a need for software-defined radios, and they expect industry to provide capability to meet some of this need through a competitive market, but has not yet defined an acquisition strategy. Finally, as we have discussed, there is still much to be determined on GCV, JLTV, and the network. For example, what is the best option for ground combat vehicles? Is it a new vehicle or modification to a current one? Can the services afford both the JLTV and the Humvee recap effort? The Army has gotten positive results from its capability portfolio reviews, and as General Lennox mentioned, um, they are able to look be beyond the individual program to identify overlaps and set priorities. On both JLTV and GCV, as the requirements have been examined more closely, the Army is finding that it can live with less in terms of capabilities and has been able to reduce cost. It is important that these reviews continue in the future and that the Army considers a broad range of alternatives. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This concludes my short statement. I will be happy to answer questions from you or members of the subcommittee. Thank you all very much for your testimony. As is my usual practice, I will reserve my questions until last, hoping they will have been asked. So I now turn to my ranking member, Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, uh, 
start with a ground combat vehicle, uh, which is the Army's number one priority uh, vehicle development program. And uh, we now we know that in an unusual move, the Army uh, has awarded two contracts to begin design work on the vehicle. Uh, but we're also told that it is also evaluating current off-the-shelf options, including a modified M2 Bradley and an Israeli-designed personnel carrier. So uh, three questions that I have. Um, what is the expected cost of these off-the-shelf vehicle evaluations? Uh, when will the Army have results uh, that it can share with the committee? Uh, and third, did the Army want to do these evaluations, or were they forced uh, on the Army by OSD acquisition uh, officials? Congressman Reyes, if I could take uh, one or two of those parts and then ask General Phillips to help on the costing information. We, in, in conjunction with OSD, came up with this strategy, and I think it's a, a, a very good one. As you know, the ground combat vehicle is the vehicle that carries our infantry soldiers, the ones closest to combat. It's going to be the one that, that has to provide the, the requisite protection, and we've learned over the last 10 years that protection Every vehicle we make, we end up adding more, more to it to, to increase protection for soldiers. And this will be the first vehicle that will be built from the ground up to do that protection. We think we have a very good path that looks at both developmental systems and non-developmental systems over the next two years, uh, approximately two years. Um, and I think by, by this time next year, we ought to have a good idea of looking at alternatives and costing them to see uh, what, what path uh, might be the best. And at the same time we're doing that, looking at developmental systems and non-developmental systems, we're going to be looking at our requirements. Um, as Ms. Martin said, do we have them right? Are they affordable? Um, how much extra power, how much protection is enough? And, and all these things come with costs, so do we have this right or not? And, and we'll be reviewing that, and we think we have a very good approach to getting that protection that we need for our soldiers. Um, General Phillips. Sir, I would add a couple of things. Through all the costing that Ms. Martin actually defined very well that we went through on GCV, we found out that we think we could bring this vehicle in for about 9 to $10.5 million, and that's what's actually in, was inside the RFP and what we're holding the two industry partners to the standard. We don't yet know what the, the non-developmental items will cost yet. That's why we're going to go out and take a more deeper look at uh, the vehicles that you just described, the Stretch Bradley and others, and potentially a striker that we will take out to the desert. Most importantly, we'll take those vehicles out to White Sands and we'll be able to put them in the hands of soldiers and let them crawl around on them, use them in an operationally relevant environment so we can learn as much from them as possible. Uh, sir, I'll make one other statement. We, we were not forced to do this in any way. It was a full partnership with OSD and the Army to go down this path. And one other statement, sir, real quick. GCV is incredibly important to the Army. After 10 years of war, we know that we need an advanced infantry fighting vehicle to better protect our soldiers. And this will be the first vehicle built from the ground up to operate in an IED environment. When we look at attrition of vehicles downrange, uh, the Bradley is the second most attrited vehicle. And we ha haven't had them in combat since, I believe, 2007, 2008. So early up in the conflict, they were getting attrited because of combat losses. We need a vehicle that can withstand the rigor of combat full spectrum. GCV, we think, is that vehicle. So, so again, uh, building one from the ground up uh, and also testing uh, the, for instance, the Israeli uh, vehicle and also the, the Stretch Bradley, as it's commonly called, uh, moving on parallel paths. And at, at what point uh, do we... Uh, do, do you think that we're going to be uh, able to ma make a decision? Is that within the next 12 months? or? So we, it probably in about the next 18 months. Uh, it'll be 24 months to milestone B uh, through the technology development phase. So in about 18 months, we'll have better informed ourselves of the requirements, what type of NDI, uh, NDI solutions might be out there. Uh, and that might inform us, that is, there, is there another vehicle out there with an NDI-like solution that we could use? So, uh, sir, in about 18 to 24 months, we'll be able to come back to the committee and let you know where we stand on that piece, sir. Are there any concerns or reservations budget-wise uh, in, in being able to keep this on track? It, it, I know it's the uh, Army's number one priority, but, you know, all of us are very much concerned as to what comes out of this uh, uh, 
in the next 30 days or so? Sir, uh, uh, I'll let General Lennox jump on this, but I'll, uh, GCV is, is fully funded through, uh, F, uh, through, throughout, beyond the budget years and through the POM years as well. So we're fully confident that we can execute the strategy, the acquisition strategy, and that we'll work with our partners to be able to make sure that it, re it remains affordable. What's critical getting to milestone B is that we want the best information possible as we execute milestone B in 24 months. So we might refine the requirements and, and, and do more cost-informed trades as we go down the path. That's why the NDI solutions and taking the vehicles out and putting them in the desert and putting them in the hands of soldiers will inform us better to make those potential trades. So you asked if we're worried about funding, and, and the answer is yes. Um, clearly, we don't know the future for 12 and out. Um, we think we have prioritized this in the Army's, Army's funding, as you mentioned, but there's a lot of unknowns um, ahead for all of us, I think. Thank you. Uh, I'll reserve my other questions uh, for later, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you. Mr. Runyon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for your uh, testimony. You kind of answered in a roundabout way my first question about there not being uh, procurement in FY12 for the Humvee. But as you talk about up armoring these vehicles, what is the life expectancy of the vehicle, and are you actually wearing on it more by up armoring it? Congressman, I think uh, you, you've hit upon an important trade-off for us. We're doing three things with our light tactical vehicles. We're doing a, uh, a recap today of the existing uh, vehicles that are coming out of combat. And, and we are worried about the weight of those vehicles carrying the armor. They're at about their capacity. So that's a big concern. The, the second thing we're doing is we're looking at potential of what you can do with this fleet of 150,000 Humvees we have today in, in a program we call the the MECV, and, and I, heart, I hate to confuse everybody with acronyms, it's the Modernized uh, Expanded Capability Vehicle, and we're experimenting over the next couple of years to see if there's something you could do with this platform that could bring new life to that vehicle. So that's a second thing that we're doing. And then the third is we're looking at the, the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, and we've just recently worked very, very hard with the Marine Corps to come to reasonable, affordable requirements of this vehicle. And our strategy is to do that side by side with the MECV, the JLTV and the MECV, in about two to three years after looking what industry can do, make a decision about the way forward, informed by uh, what industry can provide us. So in that decision process, are you, <laughs> is your readiness at a, you know, at a disadvantage there? Or are you going to have an influx of MRAPs or whatever in there also? In the interim, sir, you're exactly right. We'll, we'll be leveraging the MRAPs and, and the MRAP ATVs, and, and we have about 25,000 of those. You compare to 150,000 light tactical vehicles, so it's not enough with MRAPs and MRAP ATVs, but it is a sufficient mitigators for soldiers in combat today. That's what we're using in combat. Okay. Um, next question I had was more um, obviously we see that the Abrams is going to be in service for, what, another 34 years and we kind of fell short on up, up, updating that and its fuel efficiency. How, how do you guys look forward to actually making that feasible? Because, uh, I mean, as the numbers I'm looking at, says it saves about, uh, you know, a, a billion and a half in, the <laughs> in efficiencies over the lifespan. Um, Congressman, I think that's a, a big concern. There's uh, how do you modernize all your combat vehicles while you're trying to transform and get a new combat vehicle in the ground combat vehicle? How do you improve the ones you have to keep them relevant? And then we have another that grouping in there that just simply have to be replaced, our M113s. So what we've tried to do is prioritize. And because the Abrams is, is still the most capable um, main battle tank in the world, uh, we have prioritized that lower than some of the other, other things. And what we've approached it with is to do an engineering change proposal and get at some of the space weight and power issues now and then look for a longer-term improvement. It gets at some of the concerns that you raise, uh, energy usage, um, uh, better uh, capabilities for the future. Thank you very much, Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Kissel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I welcome our panelists here today we, uh, for very important conversations. And, and I, I want to follow up a little bit in, 
kind of in the same neighborhood and maybe rephrasing the question a little bit uh, about how we evaluate our needs. Uh, and we know that we have lots of equipment left over uh, that we're currently using that will be left over. Uh, we know that we're engaged in uh, active combat in uh, Afghanistan, pulling out of Iraq. Uh, how much do you feel constrained to, um, uh, to base your decisions upon the equipment we have now as versus what you think we might need uh, as we anticipate where the next you know, uh, challenge may be? Are, are, we, are we making decisions based upon what we have and, and kind of uh, thinking maybe the next situation would be similar? Or would we really rather break with what we have and go to new systems uh, and, and, and how, trying to figure out how to do that? I know that's somewhat a complicated question, but and, and I just wonder what your thoughts are towards how you see this conflict. Congressman, you've hit, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of the challenges that we face when you do modernization. And, and one of the officers that work for me, I, I think, said it better than anybody else. We're, we have kind of an unknown future. We don't know what the threats will be that the nation faces, but you have to be ready for those both today and tomorrow. He likens it to driving down a, a steep cliff in the dark, and you can only see out as far as your headlights. And, and I think that's a good analogy. So we try to do incremental modernization um, so that you make sure that what you have today is capable of fighting today, and you make the incremental improvements that you can. But in several cases, we're trying for transfer, tr transformation in our technologies. An example is a network, our number one priority, to get that down to the soldier and empower a soldier today with digital information, with, with data, with, with voice capabilities. We think that will be a transformation. And, and, it, and additionally, in the ground combat vehicle, we think that vehicle where we have the most soldiers um, right in the middle of facing combat, we think we need to transform that capability as well. So those are really our, our, our capabilities that are focusing on transformation. And by and large, the rest of them are focusing on incremental improvements in this period of an unknown threat in the future. Did that answer your question, sir? Yeah, because it, 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 obviously there's not a right or wrong answer here. It's more of a, uh, where our thoughts are going and how we look at balancing this out. And I was just looking for an insight to that, and I thank you for that. Uh, someone mentioned to me, uh, uh, and I, I welcome anybody answering this, but someone mentioned to me that that we're cutting back on our R&D, uh, that there are so many more ideas we have out there that could be useful, but we're cutting back on them because we feel constrained and maybe in part to, to keep using what we've had. Uh, maybe we don't want to put more resources over to R&D. Uh, but it was said to me in a way that concerned me because R&D is the lifeblood of uh, uh, someone mentioned We've got to learn to live with less. Well, that living part is what it's all about, because that's our soldiers. And, and, you know, we've got to have them living with less, but we can't. We've got to make sure we're giving them what they need. So do you have any concerns, any of you guys, uh, in, in terms of our R&D? Are we cutting back too much? Do we, are we missing some things that we could utilize uh, by, by not pursuing R&D? Uh, Congressman, I'll start and ask General Lennox to, uh, to weigh in. Uh, up front, we are concerned about the budget and how the budget will work its way through and what that will mean for R&D uh, because, as you said, most importantly, work on the projects that we want to make sure that we maintain a world-class Army uh, and our soldiers with the best equipment in the world, which is what they have today. And we can't stop investing into their future. It, it also has a tremendous impact on small businesses. And I meet quite often with small businesses. And the first thing they bring up is what's going to happen with the R&D budget and with CIBR programs and others that are so critical to the innovative research that is ongoing in small businesses today. So as, as we look at the budget, it certainly becomes a balance, as, as was just described, a balance in how, how much you have in R&D and how much you have in the rest of the program to be able to push Army modernization forward. We have to sustain that balance, but we must continue to invest at a certain level within our our R&D programs. Well, I, I know my time's running out, but it's so important that, you know, if you look at 
so many of our systems now, like the UAVs, at one point in time, that was R&D. And, and look what it means to us now. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen once, and, and ladies, once again. Thank you. Now, Mr. Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, contained in my district uh, is Fort Polk. Um, excellent Army base. It has the Infantry Brigade, Brigade Combat Team, 4th Brigade of the 10th Mountain Division. And um, though I served in the Navy, I'm told by my Army friends, my Marine friends, that your most important tool is your rifle. For me in the Navy, it was chow. But for my Army and Marine friends, it was, they say it's your rifle. So I want to ask about that. Can you elaborate on the Army's strategy for procuring, procuring a new carbon, carbine and for improving the current one? I understand it's a, there's a dual strategy going on with that. Are these strategies affordable and do you have adequate funding available in FY11 and projected in FY12? Will this uh, satisfy the requirements of USA SOC? And if not, can their online, uh, their outline, their, can you outline their modernization strategy for procuring the new carbine? Uh, Congressman, I'll, I'll take the question. Um, as you said, we do have a, a dual strategy to upgrade the M4 carbine. And I'll say up front, the M4 carbine is a remarkable weapon. Uh, the experience that we have in combat operations, we continue to measure that. The requirement for uh, the M4 is to have 600 mean rounds between systems abort. Uh, and we're currently exper experiencing about 3,500. So it's about, it's more than five times greater than the current requirement. So the current carbine our soldiers are carrying downrange is very good. Uh, but we will continue to upgrade that carbine. We're going through a series of upgrades. We've already done over 60. Uh, and we're through full and open competition, we're going to provide additional upgrades for the carbine to enhance it in, in terms of a ambidextrous dexterous, uh, trigger and also a heavier barrel to give it more capability to, con to continue to improve. Along the same, and by the way, we're converting them from M4s to M4A1s. Uh, now the other piece of the strategy is we're going to go out and look and see if there is an individual carbine that's better than the M4 is today or the M4A1. So we issued a RFP and put that on the street. We had an industry day back uh, 30 March, issued the RFP on 29 June. It closes tomorrow. So we'll get feedback from industry and they'll let us know what uh, carbine that they might be producing uh, in the commercial world potentially that might fit the bill for a new carbine inside the Army. And we're going through various phases to be able to determine whether or not industry has a better carbine than the current M4A1 is today. And at the end of that process, we'll do a business case analysis to make sure that we are getting the, it right because, again, our soldiers trust us that we're going to give them the best equipment that we can. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that answer. Um, also, I understand that the JTRS ground mobile radio program has been canceled. Uh, why and what is the Army doing? Sir, great, great question. Um, the ground mobile radio went through a rigorous comp comprehensive review between the Army and Office of Secretary of Defense. Uh, that took about 60 days of intensive review of the program itself. Up front, I'll state that the, the GMR program itself is critical to the Army's network strategy. We must have a GMR radio that will run the wideband networking waveform and the soldier radio waveform. Absolutely critical. So when we say termination, I'll use these words. It's a graceful termination. The current contract is with Boeing. Uh, we're going to let that contract expire in March of 12, and it will terminate on its own. We're not going to renew the contract. But the investments that the government has made in GMR, uh, which is significant, and what industry has also made, we know through market research that there's a number of industry partners out there that can deliver the hardware to run those two waveforms that I just mentioned. So part of our strategy is working with the industry, leveraging our investment, and we'll pu soon put an RFP on the street to ask for the hardware uh, from industry, a ground mobile radio, to run those two waveforms. And that'll happen probably next month. And sir, we, at the end of the day, this is positive for us. Uh, we'll get this radio quicker. It'll be at a lower cost than what the formal program would have delivered. And we'll get it in what we call capability set 13 and 14, so eight brigades that will deploy into combat operations. 
we'll have a GMR radio running those two waveforms, and we'll test that out at the network integration exercise at White Sands as well. So we're, what we'll do is put it in the hands of soldiers. And when you put something in the hands of soldiers and you let them uh, run around with the equipment and use it, you get remarkable feedback from our soldiers as to how well uh, that hardware will perform. We're excited about the strategy for GMR, sir. Right. Is that to say that the current uh, ground radio system we have is only one waveform? Uh, no, sir. It was designed to run numerous waveforms. It was a, the original program was a four-channel radio. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go in with a requirement for at least a two-channel radio, and, and industry will come back with their solutions. And uh, we think we'll get a much lower cost uh, and, and capable radio that will deliver those two waveforms. And also, we're working with legacy waveforms as well. They'll be available at some point to run on a GMR radio as well. Okay. Sir, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Critz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here today to testify before us. Um, going back to a couple of questions that uh, Mr. Runyon had asked, uh, one regarding the Abrams, which is going to be in service, uh, expected through 2045, um, talking about the commercial advances in engine compress compressors result in significant fuel savings. Now, I know that you weren't successful uh, in getting the reprogramming to initiate this program, uh, but I'm curious, uh, you know, this is one of the, the fuel savings, efficiency, uh, extending the life, uh, maintenance is an issue that's important to me as long with when you talk about fuel savings, the APU. I, ta I ask about this, uh, uh, I think, every time that we meet. Um, so I'm curious as how the, the Army is going to fund this effort to accelerate this critical cost-effective upgrade. And uh, I'm looking back at the 08 NDAA establish an Army product improvement program uh, to improve, uh, to implement reliability improvements. And I was wondering if the Army is going to use this authority to, to address these issues. So we didn't think it, it fit in this case. Um, the requirements are that you have to have payback within a year. We think that in order to do this, this is going to take a considerable effort. It may take four or five years of, of research development in, in order to get this capability. Okay. So what we've done is deferred it, frankly. Okay. Um, another uh, issue that came up is you were talking about the MECV and the JLTV concurrent uh, development. Now, I think it was just this week that uh, General Odierno believes that the renewed JLTV efforts are, are actually going to produce a vehicle that's more capable, better, and almost as inexpensive as recapping a Humvee. Uh, now, would you agree that the JLTV procurement or the Humvee recap is still the best value for the government? Uh, why or why not? So I think we have a good strategy. Um, what You're we're committed talking to doing two to three years, right? Yes, sir. To look at it in, the, in that time period, make sure we've got it right, test those things, test to see if they can protect soldiers, what kind of weight can they carry, um, and, and see what industry can do. Congressman, if I could add one, com one comment. We've learned a lot through the acquisition processes and lessons learned from uh, some of the challenges that we've had in the past. So what you see with JLTV today and what you've, we've also described with GCV and with Paddle and the PIM and with the M4 Carbine, we brought the requirements and the resourcing and the acquisition communities together to really drive after what requirements are driving cost, what is necessary, what's absolutely essential. And if it's not essential and it's a, hard, and it's a high driver of cost, then we need to eliminate that requirement. That's exactly what we did with the Marines. When we pulled the Marines inside the process that we used for GCV, it was really overwhelming and powerful in terms of how we got to the requirements for JLTV today. So I would just add that we're, we're very excited about what we can do with JLTV. Okay. Um, quick question about the MV program. Now, uh, it was 07 when the M113 was uh, terminated. I know the FY12 budget includes $31.4 million uh, to start an M113 replacement program, with LRIP not happening until FY 2016. Uh, now, looking back at how the Stryker vehicle was handled, was that uh, 99 Chief of Staff announces intent to acquire 2000, an award is made, 2002 it's in, in, in production, or in service actually. So is the striker model going to be used for the uh, AMPV program as to how we move this very quickly, uh, because certainly in these trying budgetary times, it would be most prudent, I believe. We're trying to figure out who, who can take this one. I want to move it much faster, <laughs> so I, I agree with you, Congressman. I think this is 
a critical capability. You have soldiers in combat today that are operating on vehicles, and then we're going to ask them to come home, and they're going to go to their motor pools, and they're going to see 113s. Yeah. And they're going to change the oil on them, and they know they're not going to take these things to combat. So we've got to figure out a way to move faster on it. The, the funding in, in 12 is critical to that, frankly. Um, we don't currently have it designed on, on the pace and speed of Stryker. Uh, there's a question of affordability and whether or not we can do that. But, but frankly, we've got to figure out a way to how to do that faster. And, and, sir, we would certainly look at applying the Stryker model and maybe doing it faster than Stryker did. Uh, Stryker was, I, I worked it from four years inside the building. And in four, less than four years, 3-2 out of Fort Lewis deployed into combat. In less than four years from the moment General Shinseki stepped on stage and said, we're going we're to do this, really remarkable. And Army acquisition did that. Uh, light utility helicopter followed the model of Stryker. So we can learn a lot from our successes in the past as well. And we would certainly look to use that opportunity. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have one more question on Crows, but I'll wait for a second round so that others can get their questions in. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hartzell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. I uh, would want to cover some questions dealing with force structure and the soldier weight unit and uh, weight load and, and the striker if we have time. But with regard to force structure um, and in terms of equipping the force, what I'd like to understand is the relationship between the current requirement of 45 active duty brigade combat teams and the cut to end strength of 27,000 uh, soldiers between 2015 and 2016. So how do you plan and program and budget for equipment with a pending in strength cut of 27,000 soldiers uh, when it's conditions based? And are there plans to reduce the current requirement of 45 active uh, duty BCTs and or exchange for a current mix of heavy infantry or striker brigades? A, a short answer, ma'am, yes to all those things. Um, a challenge for us is when you program for your equipment for the future, and we're reducing in the last budget submission 27,000 soldiers, we thought we had a, had a pretty good eye on, on what the end strength would be and the mix would be. And obviously now with the change in the, in the budget circumstances, we're going through a process that says, here's a national military strategy, here needs to be the Army strategy, here's the force structure that supports that strategy, and here's how we equip it. What's the mix of heavy, medium, and light? That works uh, going on right now, and, uh, and it is a moving target today. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't have a definitive answer for you, ma'am. It, it's made our job a little bit tougher. Well, I know it is a challenge, and I empathize with you and wish it were, weren't so. So I uh, appreciate what you're doing there. Um, as far as the soldier weight unit or weight load capacity and some of those issues, I know we had a hearing earlier in one of my subcommittees on that, and I know there's been efforts to try to reduce the, uh, the weight reduction uh, that our soldiers carry. And from what some articles have said, that there's 20,000 soldiers with right now non-deployable status due to muscle or bone injuries that can be attributed to carrying heavy uh, rucksacks over rough terrain and often high you know, altitudes over 15-month deployment. So what improvements have been made in this issue uh, to re reduce the load since 2009? Where are we at on those initiatives? Uh, Congresswoman, that, that is a great question. And General Lennox and I were just uh, at a Ford operating base not far from the Pakistan border uh, around Jalalabad, and we saw soldiers that were on patrol that were walking around carrying significant weight. Uh, we'll never do enough to lighten the weight of the soldier, but we put, we put an incredible amount of R&D and emphasis in it from everything from body armor to small arms to ounces taking off thermal weapon sites. And I'll give you just a couple of examples and, and ask General Lennox to join me. But uh, like the heavy machine gun, the M2, go into a lighter machine gun that saves about 36 pounds. And the tripod using titanium and other alloys, obviously a little more expensive, but that saves about 16 pounds. If you add that up, it accounts for, to, a, to about 50 to 55 pounds of weight saved off two soldiers carrying that in combat operations. Thermal weapon sites that save a pound or ounces, the enhanced combat helmet will save a few ounces, uh, three or four ounces itself. If we can give them a better round that's more effective and they don't have to carry as many rounds in combat operations, uh, then that saves weight as well. Body armor in uh, Afghanistan, they use the soldier plate carrier system that saves on the average about 10 pounds uh, from soldiers when they, when they have the authority to use the plate carrier system. Uh, mountain boots, we, we were just there and we saw soldiers with boots 
Uh, so we have a better mountain boot headed to Afghanistan today that's going to save a, about a pound each, uh, and it's going to actually wick moisture away and operate better in a high, hot, mountainous environment. And there's lightweight mortars and other systems that, are, that we're working on as well, ma'am. We have to do more, though. Right. Yes. Chair. It's funny, ma'am. You know, we, we've done all these things, and when you go out and visit the soldiers like we did, you find they're still carrying 100 to 130 pounds worth of gear. So you take a little bit off, and, and they'll add something on. Uh, extra water, extra ammunition. Um, so it, it's going to be a constant challenge for us. We've requested about $80 million in 12 to look at you know, further technologies and efforts to get after those kind of things and continue the effort. We have a, a business in my district that is doing some, uh, some research on body armor, and, and the, the weight significantly is, is less than what's currently out there. So I know there's a lot of efforts being made to try to do that. But it's still shocking that you're carrying around a 8, 10, 12-hour days, whatever, that much weight. Ma'am, we would be glad to hear from your industry partners and their ideas. Sure. Uh, the few, oh, eight seconds left. I guess we're done. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Sangas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your testimony. Um, I know you're wrestling with some really tough choices, and I appreciate um, I appreciate your great commitment to our country. I had wanted to ask a question around the area of unmanned systems. Uh, so given the successes we've seen, um, and I think uh, in protecting our men and women in uniform from IEDs and other threats, I am concerned that the Army isn't fully uh, invested in the deployment of unmanned future, unmanned uh, ground vehicle systems uh, to further support our troops. So I'm just wondering is that the case? Is there a strategy in place? Um, what do you see coming? Yes, ma'am. We, we had a program that was um, producing a very large unmanned vehicle um, with autonomous navigation system. It was very complex and, and expensive. And we did stop that program. We have um, sent to Afghanistan a variety of other uh, programs that have smaller vehicles to try to get at understanding how the soldiers would actually use those vehicles in combat. Are they um, uh, good replacements for trucks and, and to take some of the load off of a soldier's back or not? So we have some experiments going in theater. We're hoping to learn from that and, and inform us for the future in that regard. So it's not necessarily a coherent strategy. It's just sort of uh, trying something, trying something else, evolving with it. I think we found what we were doing was not was producing something that wasn't cost effective, was very expensive, and didn't produce the results we wanted. So really what we're doing is seeing what soldiers want and what will work as a way to informing us for the future. And I imagine there's some smaller way, uh, d ways to deal with this on a much smaller scale as well. I, I certainly have companies in my district in the robotics area that um, are constantly sort of coming at this in very different ways. Ma'am, could I uh, uh, take that on for a second? I would encourage the companies that, that you have within your dis district or anywhere in the U.S. that are interested in, in this. Uh, we, we are doing some remarkable work at the network integration uh, evaluation out at White Sands and Fort Bliss. And we're asking industry and partnering with the industry to come and show us what their great ideas are based upon gaps that we have in the Army. And General Lennox just described one of our gaps. If there are companies that are interested in that, we periodically will do this every six months and we'll issue a, a uh, RFI request for information that will go out and is published in, 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 on the federal web, web pages. If companies have an interest in solving one of those gaps, we certainly want them to come forward. And those companies that you just described might be critical to us identifying the right capability to meet a gap. And what's important about White Sands is we can test it in an operationally relevant environment before we take it downrange and then try to solve the problem, problem with soldiers that are in combat and performing combat operations. We can do that at White Sands. So we want their feedback. Well, you raise an interesting issue. This past week we had a district work period, and I have a lot. Massachusetts is home to many also clean energy companies. We have a robotics cluster. We have a lot of clean energy companies. 
and many of them were looking for ways to uh, work with the Defense Department. And we actually put together a, um, a session in the morning in which representatives came to talk to these companies. They're not in the cyber community. They're not as familiar with the processes. They're highly, highly innovative. Uh, and see a real opportunity to work with the Defense Department to solve some problems. So I can see where there's, there are many ways in which this is also in the robotics community as well. But it raises another issue, and that is I'm going to channel Congresswoman Giffords for a minute, and we would do wish she were here. But as you talk about modernization, how do you think about energy consumption, and how do you factor that into uh, your efforts going forward? Uh, um, an important aspect, ma'am, and growing important aspect in, in how we uh, determine our requirements. We do look at energy and energy consumption, and, and it is a factor as, as, we, as we look at new purchases. So, for example, in the ground combat vehicle, one of our requirements is it needs to be more fuel efficient per pound uh, of vehicle than its predecessor is. That doesn't mean, unfortunately, that will be more fuel efficient overall, but, but we'll get a better aspect um, and we're open to different kinds of technologies. I don't know if I can talk about those technologies, but different kinds of technologies that may come with the program as a solution to that problem. Right. And ma'am, we are ratcheting up our em emphasis on energy and energy efficiency. The JLTV has a requirement similar to what General Lennox just described as well. Uh, and we learned a lot from the technical development phase, which will all translate into the JLTV strategy that we're pushing forward. Uh, TRADOC, our TRADOC, Training and Doctorate Command, uh, continues to work on capability documents to address energy, energy efficiencies as well. And I, I think this will be in a current NIE, but we'll ask for companies to come forward and share with us their great ideas on energy efficiency. It might be generators, it might be something else, but to help us become more energy efficient. Uh, we're, we're taking that on and we're very serious about it as well. I'm glad to hear it. I can only see good things coming of that. Um, as you wrestle with the high cost of energy, you have to look at ways to both conserve energy or use alternative fuels. And the more you're able to work with the private sector and these very innovative thinkers out there, I can only see good things coming. So I encourage, encourage you to continue down that path. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Loviando. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, generals, for being here today. Can you uh, uh, talk a little bit or share what is the strategy or plan to provide the Army with a modern armed aerial scout aircraft to replace the old uh, OH-58? Congressman, thanks. Um, we are currently uh, looking for a fly-off over the next year of various con uh, commercial off-the-shelf, uh, very limited adaptation platforms that could help us meet this requirement. Uh, it will be uh, a challenge for us with uh, costing uh, um, within our top line of the future. That will be a big factor. Uh, the capabilities of that aircraft, um, as you know, our, our air, I think you know better than anybody, our aircraft are being flown uh, significantly. The CH-47 Foxtrots um, are being flown significantly. The Kiowa Warriors are being flown significantly in theater. We have to find a replacement for the Kiowa Warriors over time. It's an old platform. And this fly-off is a little bit like the striker approach that we talked about earlier uh, to try to see what, what candidates there are out there. Uh, thank you. Also, um, what is the Army strategy going forward for enhanced medium altitude reconnaissance and surveillance system? The um, under review right now, sir. Um, you know, I've said in the press and probably spoke out of hand in the last couple of weeks, but it, but we're looking seriously at a lot of these capabilities. Can they be done in the Army? Should they be done in the Air Force? Uh, how many of these platforms should be purchased over time? Um, and, and is the capability that's in theater doing that mission today something that can be replicated very quickly if you need it in the future? So. This, this aircraft, fixed-wing aircraft, for example, today has some, some uh, SIGINT capabilities in the back of it. Can that be replicated if you don't have a big investment today? Can you rapidly replicate it in the future? And these are all the things that we're considering now in the, in the ultimate decision about the EMARS uh, aircraft. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, 
Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Wilson. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ms. Martin. Generals, thank you all for being here today. Uh, as uh, Ms. Hartzler was asking you questions and the uh, new boots weighing a, a pound less, I was thinking back to around eight years ago when I retired after 31 years. And uh, it's exciting to me. I want to thank you uh, that we have multiple generations of uh, improvements to uniforms equipment uh, from just the time that I served. And indeed, I point out to people, and I mean this as a compliment to you, uh, that my uniform uh, would be more appropriate in a museum. So um, uh, it, it's just exciting what you do. I want to um, put a bug in your ear, too, uh, that in the district I represent, which includes the Savannah River site, there's a great deal of research for modular nuclear reactors. Uh, and these, um, to me, are safe, secure, clean, uh, but could have uh, extraordinary military application on um, facilities such as Fort Jackson, uh, or actually uh, more remote uh, when I was at uh, Kandahar to see the size, uh, Bagram Balad, um, the size of uh, uh, facilities and the security that could be provided, and uh, a, a wonderful place uh, that I uh, greatly appreciate the island territory of Guam. Um, but uh, so I hope that y'all are looking in to uh, the techno advancing technology of, of modular nuclear reactors. Um, and uh, General Lennox, currently the Army is considering two program solicitations one for a new individual carbine to replace the M4 and M16, and another for product improvements to the current platforms. In your judgment, does the Army have the funds to do both? Congressman Wilson, I, I think that's a, a good question. What we're trying to do now is see what improvements we can make to the current M4, the M4A1, and, and it's performing, uh, the M4 itself is performing magnificently in, in combat today. The M4A1, we're, we're continuing to improve. And, and in the meantime, we think doing this carbine competition will inform us uh, about what the best path is in the future. Now, affordability is going to be a big issue, frankly. Uh, we've got about 500,000 M4s, and um, to start over from scratch will be a, a challenge for us, and it will be influenced by uh, what the, the budgetary environment looks like when we come to make this decision. I think in, in about three years is the time frame for this. So we're going to continue along this path. Uh, we're going to see what industry is capable for uh, of producing. We think there's a lot of exciting things being done out there, but affordability is going to be an important fact. Uh, another factor uh, is any assurance that you can provide. The Army did not conceive the new carbine requirements without first examining already existing new weapons platforms, such as the Special Operations Command carbine competition. Sir, I can confirm that. We looked uh, through market research what currently exists inside uh, the Army Special Operations Command and in industry, uh, we looked holistically before we proceeded with the uh, program, sir. I, I, I have three sons serving in the Army, so I actually have a personal interest. So thank you again for what uh, both of you all are doing. And Ms. Martin, uh, as the Army approaches the launch of the technology development phase of the ground combat vehicle, what do you see as the major areas of risk for this program to meet the performance expectations within a seven-year schedule? Um, thank you, uh, Representative Wilson. Uh, as I mentioned in the, the testimony, we have identified a, a number of, of questions. Um, one, urgency of the need, um, cost and affordability, the robustness of the analysis of alternatives, and again, the, the plausibility of delivering on that schedule. Um, and in the technology to development phase, as the generals have mentioned, there will be an opportunity to not only look at um, the vehicles that are being developed, but also look at non-developmental items as well as refining the requirements. So to the extent that these activities um, take place during the technology development phase, uh, that should position the Army to be in a better place in um, 18 months to two years to be able to make a decision as to whether a new vehicle is the right answer or maybe modifications to a current vehicle. Well, thank you for that very thorough response. Thank you. Uh, and both generals, has the Army prioritized components within the product improvement program? Can you distinguish between sustainment and improvement? 
I think um, both those are important aspects of incremental modernization, Congressman. I think the, um, increasingly we are looking at sustainment costs. I don't know that we have always done that in weighing that versus um, affordability in, in making the initial improvements. So some of the earlier comments we made about the, the big savings you could make if, if you did something to the Abrams engine are absolutely true. The question is, can you afford to do them or not? So we are weighing sustainment costs as an aspect of this as we make decisions. Again, thank you all for your service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Platts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be very brief. Actually, uh, Congressman Wilson touched on the M4 issue, which is uh, what I was going to focus on. Appreciate that update, and um, you know, we'll uh, be anxious to see what the results going forward are, and whether you go. You know, uh, my, my son and I shoot uh, our M4s pretty regularly, and it, the fact that it allows me to hit um, 200 yards out with open uh, sights is, uh, speaks to the, what a great weapon it is, because uh, I don't have that, that great a shooting eyesight, but uh, <laughs> um, it's, uh, it certainly is a proven record, and, and I think the balance that you're taking, whether you can up improve it, but also within budget constraints, is an important one. Uh, and finding that right match going forward. So the um, final comment is just a, a word of thanks. I know the assignment uh, you've both been given and your colleagues of um, continuing to meet the needs of our, of our Army uh, in these budget times with the cuts that are coming uh, is a challenging one, and we're grateful for your leadership and uh, your efforts in meeting that challenge. So appreciate your service. Uh, with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. As anticipated, most of the questions I uh, thought needed asked have been asked, but I have just a couple questions. Uh, I have a brief question for the record. Uh, on August 1, in response to a letter to the Secretary of the Army, uh, we got the response that, and I quote, the draft addendum does not include a KPP against rocket-propelled grenades. However, General Ordiano stated in testimony on 21 July of this year, and I quote, the competitive Humvee recap program will incorporate scalable protection and plan for additional protection against rocket-propelled grenades. It would seem to me to, be, to only make sense that the Army would provide similar or greater protection against RPGs for the MECV Humvee recap program as is provided today for the MATV. And my question is, and give me a one-word answer today, and if you want to amplify, do that for the record. Could you confirm that the Army plans to include RPG protection as a requirement as part of the uh, make the Humvee recap program. A one-word answer and then amplify for the record if you wish. Sir, I'll answer. The answer is yes. Thank you. But we... <laughs> you were, <laughs> and you can amplify for the record. That, that Sir, that, we will amplify for the record. We've yes, learned so you. much from uh, thank you very operations much. downrange. Uh, I have a couple of questions for our witness uh, from uh, GAO. Uh, you mentioned that uh, of the requirements for one of our developments was not achievable. And I have a, a question about uh, requirements. We need to ask two questions about requirements that I'm not sure we ask and adequately answer in our developments. The first question is just that question, is the requirement achievable? And the second question is maybe an even more important question. After you decide that, yes, it is achievable, then we need to know, do we really need to do all that? Maybe getting 95% of the way there for half the cost will be quite adequate. At some point, my farmer friend would say, I'm not sure the juice is worth the squeezing. And do you think that we have an adequate procedure for addressing these two questions in our development programs. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I, I think within the acquisition process, um, there is ample opportunity to develop and refine requirements. And I think all three of us have talked about that process a, a bit today. Um, we sometimes start out with um, requirements that may be nice to have, 
but as we go through the technology development and other phases of the acquisition process, there are ample opportunities to refine those requirements because we match them with costs, with schedule, uh, and determine affordability. And certainly we saw with the JLTV uh, program that some of the original projected requirements when they went into tech development were not um, achievable. Um, the, to get the uh, protection um, that they needed, um, you would not be able to um, be able to still transport um, the vehicle because it would weigh too much. So there were some trades there. So again, the acquisition process does allow for uh, trades and requirements. Um, and General Lennox talked about the uh, portfolio reviews. That's another opportunity to really look at capabilities, look at um, programs across a spectrum and kind of determine there what do we really need um, with respect to capabilities, what can we live without, and in doing that you have the opportunity to drive down cost. Our procurement history, I think, indicates that we may not be aggressive enough in asking these questions and answering them because it's only in very rare development cases that we do not uh, have a program that runs too long and costs too much as compared to our original expectations. So I would hope that we might have a more vigorous dialogue on these two things. First of all, is it attainable? And secondly, do you really need that much at that cost? And if these, answering these questions in today's environment is going to be even more important. Um, as the Army proceeds to implement its network investment strategy, what advice would GAO offer the Army on how to proceed? What are the major areas of risk for the Army to focus its management attention on? Um, well, as I mentioned in, in my uh, short statement, we think the evaluations that are taking place at uh, Fort Bliss are um, a good step forward. Um, they allow the uh, Army to identify some baseline capabilities. Um, there's an opportunity for um, incrementally building on the capabilities that are there. Obviously getting input from the soldier is, is very important because they are the ones that are ultimately using this equipment. Um, a couple of independent um, test um, evaluators have talked about the importance of being able to gather kind of objective and measurable data. And I think that is something that hopefully the Army will do as they continue uh, these evaluations. And we also uh, mentioned the importance of having overall requirements for the network so that you fully understand how the various pieces fit together. But by and large, we certainly think that these evaluations um, are a, a positive step forward and can um, glean a lot of, of really um, useful information as the Army moves forward. Thank you. I have another comment or question or two, but uh, we will do that at the end of a second round of questions. Uh, my ranking member, Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have one uh, other question. Uh, it re it's regarding to the joint air to ground missile. Uh, does the Army still have a requirement for this weapon? Yes, sir, we do. And uh, while the program has been delayed, are you aware of any technical problems or major requirement changes that might lead to uh, a potential decision to, to terminate it? I, um, Congressman Reyes, what we're struggling with now is that we have a, a number of the highest priority programs that we want to fund. And then there's another tier that we have to ask ourselves, can you afford these in the future? JAGM is a, uh, as a program has been very effective and is, and is working with, without problems, but it will ultimately be a question of affordability. And no decisions have been made yet, but that will be one of the areas, uh, one, of the, one of the programs we're going to have to ask ourselves, do you continue with Hellfire, um, which is doing well in combat today, or do you go to the next generation? Kind of getting at some of the conversations we've had earlier, is incremental improvement or, or should we go to the next generation and can you afford to do that? And that will be something we're going to be wrestling with. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have. Mr. Kretz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in res in, I'm having trouble with my microphone. Um, in talking about the commonly remote 
operated weapon station, the Crow system. Um, I have three questions that, that uh, revolve around the Crows, and mainly because I'm a little baffled. Uh, in the first performance specs on both the Humvee recap and the JLTV, uh, they included a requirement for the Crows. Subsequent updates uh, to both performance specs removed the Crows requirement. The alternative to having a Crow system leaves a gunner exposed to snipers and IEDs. We know that. With the Army's commitment to the Crow system as part of the Striker and MRAP programs, why would this capability be removed from the Humvee recap and the JLTV? So I guess there's three questions. Is this system working? Uh, two, why was it removed from the spec? And if it's, we're dedicated to it in the Striker and the MRAP, why aren't we keeping it on the Humvee recap and the JLTV? Okay. Microphone. Sorry, sir. Uh, Crows is working well, and uh, in use as you just described in MRAPs and other vehicles in combat operations today. And number two, the reason it was removed is because it will remain a part of the actual system, uh, and whoever results from the winner of the MECV program, the Humvee recap, will actually be charged to integrate the Crows system inside the vehicle itself. So Crows is actually a part of our program going forward, even though it may not be an integral part of the phase one, which is the RDT and E, that we want to uh, the companies that are interested in the MECV program to be interested or to come forward with. So it will be a part of the final solution for both JLTV and for the MECV. Okay. All right. Thanks. And, and one quick um on the uh, AMP-V program, um, now, General Phillips, you had said that um, you sort of snickered when I asked about could we mirror the striker, but then you said maybe you could do it quicker. Now, is there anything, are you hinting or intimating that there's something that we could do on this committee to be helpful in that aspect? Uh, sir, if there is something that we need your help with, we'll, we'll certainly come forward and, and ask for your help and, <laughs> and support. Some, if I can talk about the acquisition process just for one second, sometimes we hide behind the laws and the rules and the statutory and policy requirements. I think if we try to work within them better and to better understand them, we might be able to accomplish the mission. And that's exactly what we did with Stryker, what we did with the uh, light utility helicopter. And it's what we're trying to do today with rapid acquisition and a more agile acquisition process using White Sands and the NIE effort that we have ongoing. So. First, we'll try to, we will work within the process itself and try to achieve efficiencies. So if we need your help, we will come in and ask you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. At least to uh, some extent, what you all are now doing and uh, what we're doing here today in this hearing and the series of hearings that we're having in this committee are uh, exercises in futility because there are two questions to which we do not have an answer and we really need an answer to these two questions before we can rationally and intelligently to proceed one of those is what will be our future strategy there is a uh, considerable concern that we will not be able to use our military in the future the way we have used it in the past and we have not really come to terms with that we do not have a strategy until you have a strategy you do not know what kind of military you will need and having decided that question then the next question to which we do not have an answer is how much money will we have and so I apologize for the uh, uh, uncertainties that we uh, labor under. We do not know what our national strategy for the use of our military will be for coming years, and we do not know how much money we will have to implement that strategy. So thank you for persevering and serving your country under the, in these difficult times. Thank you very much for your testimony. Do the members of the uh, subcommittee have any additional questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much for being with us today.